Thank you for joining our 3D Printing Peak Pack and Autumn webinar. Today, we're going to go over high performance materials, a bit about their properties, touch on the process considerations when printing them, and also talk about the hardware requirements needed to successfully print them. My name is Eric Beardsley, and I am the Content and Product Marketing Manager here at Aon 3D. I come with over six years of additive manufacturing experience spanning numerous technologies, including metals, resins, and thermoplastics. I am joined by my coworker, Viv Campbell, who specializes in materials engineering and additive manufacturing, and will be teaching us more about thermoplastics and fused filament fabrication. Before I begin, I wanna talk a little bit more about Aon 3D. We were founded in 2015 by a team of material engineers. And for this reason, we have a strong focus on materials because we believe that materials equal applications and applications equal ROI across the value chain. Our solutions drive innovation for hundreds of companies across the world, including small to medium sized businesses, uh, Fortune 500 corporations, and also government agencies. We offer the Aon M2 Plus. Now in its fifth generation, the Aon M2 Plus is a high temperature industrial 3D printer for manufacturing full scale, strong, high performance parts. Uh, much like our philosophy, the Aon M2 Plus unlocks applications with ungated access to the world's most advanced polymers, including Peak, Peck, and Ultim. The large sheet of bow volume allows you to create large functional parts. Configurable process parameters allow you to achieve the best final part properties. And many of our features are aimed at printing more reliably and repeatably while reducing time-consuming post-processing. Now for our agenda. Today, we are gonna give you an introduction into thermoplastics teach you about three of the most prevalent high performance materials, Peak, Peck, and Ultim, tell you a bit about the challenges that you might incur while printing these materials, and also the hardware requirements to do so successfully. And now I'm gonna hand it off to my coworker, Viv. Thanks, Eric. To start out today, I'm going to be talking about the different kinds of thermoplastic polymers that we use in FFF additive manufacturing and some of their key characteristics. The thermoplastic pyramid represents both prevalence of materials and also a hierarchy of material properties. Here, they are categorized into three families. Commodity polymers, such as PLA and ABS, engineering grade polymers, like PA and nylon and TPU, and high performance polymers, which include PEAK, PEC, and ALTIM, some of the most advanced polymers to date. In addition, the pyramid is split up into amorphous and semicrystalline materials. Amorphous and semicrystalline polymers are classified by the organization of their molecular chains. As you can see in this picture, amorphous thermoplastics have randomly ordered molecular structure and lack a sharp melting point. This makes them less likely to warp and more dimensionally accurate. While amorphous materials like PEC and Ultim have high chemical resistance, they have less resistance compared to semicrystalline materials. In addition, these materials have less fatigue resistance, so they're less suited for bearings and wear components. As seen in this picture, semicrystalline materials have areas of highly ordered and tightly packed molecular chains. This gives them a sharper melting point and impressive chemical and thermal resistance and increased strength, but they tend to be less impact resistant and suffer from shrinkage due to crystallization. Heat, among other factors, determines the level of crystallinity of your final part. Semicrystalline materials printed at lower temperatures will have mostly amorphous regions with little crystallization. This can be remedied by post-print annealing, but annealing often results in warping and overall distortion of the part. Now switching to the polymer families. Commodity polymers such as PLA, ABS, and ASA are low cost and easy to print. Most 3D printers on the market can print these materials with relative ease. Although ABS and ASA do require a warm, stable printing environment. Mechanical, chemical, and thermal properties are limited in this family, but these materials are ideal for aesthetic models and early iterations of designs. Engineering grade polymers include nylons and polycarbonates. These materials are relatively cheap and possess heightened material properties. This is the cutoff for nearly all prosumer 3D printers, and even then, passive chamber heating is often inadequate and will result in warping and cracking, as well as reduced part isotopy due to weak interlayer adhesion. With higher processing temperatures, these materials can be made into parts suitable for moderate strength applications, including functional prototypes, manufacturing jigs and fixtures, 
and a variety of end-use applications. Now we move on to the high-performance polymers. These polymers exhibit some of the best material properties currently available in thermoplastics. We've curated just a small list of material properties found in this family of polymers. Most notably, these materials can provide a higher strength to weight ratio than many metals, plus high heat and chemical resistance. In addition, some of these polymers are rated UL94 V0 and meet FSD requirements, which makes them suitable for aviation, naval, and other regulated industry applications. Continuing on, these materials can have high wear resistance and a low coefficient of friction, making them great for bearing and gear applications. They also have numerous medical applications, including medical tools and implants. Diving a bit deeper, let's take a look specifically at PEAK, PEC, and ULTIM. While these polymers do not encompass the whole category, they are some of the most well-known and provide a balance of price, material properties, and ease of printing. PEAK is a semi-crystalline polymer with one of the highest mechanical properties of any available thermoplastic on the market. The specific strength exceeds that of metals like aluminum and stainless steel, making it a great candidate for metal replacement. PEAK also has high temperature and chemical resistance and is biocompatible. PEC is a high temperature thermoplastic with properties that can approach those of PEAK. Both materials belong to the same family of PAEK or P-A-E-K polymers, but PEC is a copolymer made up of two slightly different repeating chemical units. Adjusting the ratio of these two units allows the properties of the material to be adjusted, resulting in a material that is easier to print compared to PEAK while maintaining good mechanical and chemical performance. This polymer can be found in both amorphous and semi-crystalline variations. Altum, known as polyether imide or PEI, is an amorphous polymer that is well known in the aerospace industry for its high strength, high heat and chemical resistance, and low air gassing under vacuum. It's also the most affordable of the three high performance polymers we've discussed. Altum 9085 also meets UL 94V0 standards and FAR 25853 requirements, which demonstrates low flammability, smoke intensity, and combustion toxicity. Now let's move on to process considerations to be aware of when printing high performance polymers. A key consideration for high-temperature semi-crystalline polymers is crystallization-induced shrinkage. Now, all polymers shrink as they cool. The yellow line on this graph shows the volume change with temperature of an amorphous polymer. But in semi-crystalline polymers, the blue line, shrinkage occurs due to both thermal contraction and crystallization. Once the semi-crystalline polymer is extruded, crystallization can occur in mere seconds as the polymer bead cools. As crystals form, the volume of material decreases since organized crystals occupy less space than the amorphous, randomly oriented phase. Uncontrolled shrinkage in additive manufacturing can lead to residual stress, which manifests as warped parts and low interlayer weld strength. Let's discuss what residual stress is and how we can reduce it when printing high temperature thermoplastics. Heat is brought into a 3D printed part continuously from the top surface due to the layer by layer process. Layers below the newly deposited track will cool relative to the extrusion temperature and heat will transfer from the top layer in three ways. Conductive heat transfer to the cooled layers below, convective heat transfer to the air around the part, and radiative heat transfer to the rest of the part and build chamber. As heat is lost rapidly from the top layer, the layer begins to shrink. But since the top layer is constrained by the previous layers beneath, it is not able to shrink or deform significantly. Residual stress is created when a material has the propensity to shrink, but is physically restricted. Now, if you were to remove this part from the build plate, you would immediately notice that the edges curl. This happens because the part is no longer constrained to the build plate, and is free to deform, relaxing the residual stress. Higher residual stress equals greater warping in printed parts, as well as poor interlayer weld strength. So we know that warping can occur during printing due to thermal contraction and crystallization. If the adhesion strength between the build plate and the part is low, the edges of the print can detach and curl upwards. This can be mitigated by increasing the adhesion with material-compatible build sheets, adhesives, or by adding a brim or anchors to the part. 
But even with increased bed adhesion, we still have residual stress in the part due to the rapid thermal contraction during printing. The way to solve this is to introduce build chamber heating. Printing the part in a heated environment reduces the sharp thermal contraction that creates residual stress layer by layer, and instead allows the part to cool slowly and uniformly at the end of the print. You may have heard that 3D printed parts are the weakest in the Z direction, but why is that? It all comes down to the layer by layer deposition process. When new layers are deposited, heat is imparted to layers below, which promotes the migration of polymer chains between layers. A high degree of interaction between these polymer chains results in high interlayer weld strength. In amorphous polymers, you want to print with high build chamber temperatures near the glass transition point to ensure chain migration, which will maximize the Z-axis properties. Semi-crystalline polymers are a bit trickier. Crystallization and shrinkage during printing leads to residual stress, which weakens layer strength. Crystallization can also prevent polymer chain migration and lower the interlayer weld strength. There are two approaches here. Printing in cold conditions, where the polymer is cooled rapidly from extrusion temperature to a cold chamber temperature, resulting in an amorphous print. Crystallization is achieved in post-processing through a heated annealing process. This provides good layer welding, but there is significant risk of deformation. The other method is in situ crystallization. A high chamber temperature and very high nozzle temperature promote in situ crystallization while the bead is laid down. This method can achieve acceptable layer welding without the need for post-processing. Only printers with chamber temperatures close to or above the glass transition temperatures of these polymers are able to achieve this. Now I'm gonna hand it off to Eric to talk a little more about selecting the right printer. Thank you for that, Viv. For our last topic, let's discuss the printer requirements for high-performance polymers. This is extremely important because simply 3D printing high-performance materials does not guarantee that your final part will possess the same properties as the parent polymer. One of the most important factors when choosing a 3D printer is thermal conditions and management. To successfully process these materials, your build volume should be able to reach near glass transition temperature of the material. Printing materials like peak under 130 C will often result in increased anisotropy, significantly lower chemical resistance and more. In addition, your parts are gonna re require additional annealing, which is going to result in unavoidable warping. Heat uniformity is also important since this can cause reduced use of the build volume, warping, poor bed adhesion, and inconsistent crystallization of parts. The ability to change build sheet materials is highly important both to the reliability of the printer, but also time to part. When you're able to print materials on build surfaces that are chemically similar to themselves, it creates a mechanical bond which negates the need for rafts, which also require time-consuming part cleanup, and you also run the risk of breaking your parts. As you can see in this video, we effortlessly removed this Ultim 9085 part printed on a reasonable carbon fiber peak build plate, you know, we're exposing an almost near flawless base layer without the use of rafts or adhesion aids. Dual extrusion is another highly important feature in that it enables you to print complex geometries like steep overhangs and internal geometries via soluble supports and breakaway supports. Uh, in addition, dual extrusion is going to significantly reduce manual part cleanup. If possible, Independent dual extrusion is recommended. Fixed dual extrusions can result in thermal bleed and oozing, and in increased extruder mass creates printing artifacts like ringing and ghosting. While we do provide you with validated material profiles from preferred vendors, the ability to modify your process parameters allows you to go a step further in terms of optimizing your designs for your applications. This includes reducing part porosity, uh, improving part isotropy and weld strength. Uh, you can optimize for speed times, fine details, surface finish, or create airtight models. The list really goes on, uh, but the ability to change those process parameters is the important thing here. Now to look at process control in action. Uh, this is just one example, but as you see up here in the upper right, 
Uh, this is a cross section of a 3D printed ABS tensile bar examined with microscopy to show a near zero porosity. Below, a microscopy of a Victrex LM PIC tensile bar is shown after compression shear test to reveal low porosity and also strong inner layer weld strength. Another feature we highly recommend you look for is open materials. With open materials, you're going to get far more material options at, and at better prices, which in turn is going to impact how you can use the 3D printer and overall ROI. The comparable closed system we used in this uh, only offered 13 materials and did not include peak. Furthermore, if you look up top here, ABS and ASA were running over 700% of the market price. These are materials that you're going to use very frequently and at quantity early on in the product development life cycle. So you can see how those prices really start to add up. Making matters worse, some of these machines will actually charge you material license fees to unlock new materials. These can run as high as $10,000 per material. In addition, they also might charge you to upgrade the machine just to be able to print composite materials like carbon fiber peak. Once again, we are Aon 3D and we offer the Aon M2 Plus. If you're looking for an industrial 3D printer that unlocks applications, we suggest you reach out and talk to one of our additive manufacturing specialists. Keep in mind, we are more than a hardware company. Aon 3D provides next level service and support. Our success plans help businesses get started fast, minimize downtime, and quickly become experts in industrial additive manufacturing. Thanks again for your time. If you have any questions about the Aon M2 Plus or this presentation, you can find our contact information here on this slide, or just look for a link in the description of this, vi description of this video.